names. Uh, we operate a business that already uh, exists for four years, uh, based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. But we're now adapting blockchain to... Turning Cheers. you into some kind of bionic... <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, but we're adapting and harnessing the power of blockchain to automate specific processes that are extremely unscalable uh, in our line of business, but also um, you know, we want to spice things a little bit up in terms of what you can do with uh, domains and so on. So, without further ado, let's take a quick look at how the industry currently looks. The domain industry is one of the first internet industries, which is great, uh, but that also brings some issues because the industry is ruled by very outdated and extremely inefficient uh, companies. If we look at how many, there are about 343 million domain names registered. However, of all those domains, 174 million are currently unused. Uh, so we're talking about 405 billion euros worth of virtual land that uh, none of us have really good uh, access to. Nothing is happening with these, uh, these assets. Um, they're just sitting there which is a bad, bad thing. Uh, now we went too far. So, in the past years, we've seen that every part of the startup uh, infrastructure is becoming more and more instantly deployable. Uh, you fire up uh, servers uh, cheap at instant. Uh, billing, support, payrolling, it's all SaaS. Uh, but how about uh, branding? So why does it take so much effort, time, research, uh, and so on, all these weird processes, middlemen, and whatnot, just to acquire a domain from someone else uh, on the other side of the world? You need all these trust processes in place. It's uh, extremely inefficient, frustrating, uh, and a painful uh, situation to be in. Um, and I'm, I'm sure everyone that has gone through that process knows about it. So, why isn't it just simple, uh, simply possible to uh, go to a marketplace or the registrar you use or the hosting provider or whatsoever to see a name that would be perfect for your business and just rent it, maybe for an hour, see what kind of traffic is on it. Rent it for a week, uh, a month, a year, or indefinitely for as long as you pay, or lease it. Uh, why can't we have uh, multiple owners for a specific domain name? Uh, why can't we just easily set up a crowd uh, funding campaign to fund, for example, a domain name that I would really like to use? Maybe my family can help me out uh, to get started. All these things are not possible uh, for one reason. It doesn't scale. Currently, at Undeveloped, we have escrow agents guiding all these transactions. So go imagine if we have to handle 10,000s of, you know, all these uh, very specific transaction types. It's impossible. And that's why, uh, you know, nothing has uh, happened in that, uh, on that front um, in the past years. Branding will become infrastructure uh, as well. That's why a couple of months ago, we started already, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, a prototype, a, a, a user case with, uh, with the .store extension uh, registry. So they operate the .store extension um, to get some domain names rented. But not only the .store, also other clients. We bought it to find out what kind of you know, variables do people want when they uh, engage in these kind of transactions and whatnot. And uh, what kind of processes do we need to automate in order to allow that to scale? Meet Dan, what we call the Domain Automation Network. Dan is currently being built uh, by Undeveloped. I will tell you a little bit later from what kind of uh, structure, but what we're in essence doing is we're automating everything required to transact domain names from the secondary market. Uh, but we go beyond that. We also look at how can we uh, automatically and fully automated uh, allow um, very, you know, complex uh, transaction types as well that aren't managed by escrow agents, um, humans, <laughs> so to say, but 
you know, by the, by the machine. And that's when uh, Dan uh, kicked in, and that's where blockchain also kicked in. Uh, because you can automate specific processes, but not all. And we had to work with, you know, the existing uh, world that, uh, that, that we have to work with, you know, because there are already so many structures and whatnot existing in the domain industry, uh, speaking of ICANN, the regulatory body, and uh, whatnot. Um, uh, for example, uh, if you want to rent out domain names in the current world, uh, the own domain ownership can change. And that's already a huge problem, uh, because if, uh, if you rent out a domain name, then the rentee does something crazy on your domain name uh, that's not allowed. In the current world, the current owner uh, will be responsible. Uh, but what we're doing and how we're using blockchain is we're introducing a complete new layer on our own ledger of rentees. So you can look up for a specific domain name for, that's uh, under a, a rental agreement, for example, for a specific duration, who is actually using this domain name or who used that domain name uh, to solve simple issues uh, like that. But I won't bore you guys more with, uh, with this. Um, another very interesting um, uh, you know, uh, thing that, um, the, the, let's say, the blockchain world introduced uh, was that as a collective, you can all of a sudden uh, create these consortiums that back in the days would take, you know, would only be possible for big companies. But now a relative small company like ours uh, has created a, a setup where literally every single competitor of ours uh, can even join the initiative. So we're, as a collective, creating this new technology, this new way of uh, automating uh, domain escrow and whatnot and making the whole industry more efficient and we're allowing literally everyone from the existing industry or anyone else that later down the road would like to uh, join the, uh, the, the initiative uh, to do so. So this is a, so if, we, if we look at our uh, setup, the whole then network will be created from a, from a stichting, uh, so a non-profit. Um, the the non-profit will create the network, uh, and then um, anyone can become a network integrator. So undeveloped, of course, will be uh, one of the first integrators, as we, uh, we we really believe that the market has to go in this direction. Uh, but anyone else, like I said, could uh, could join as well. Um, and doing something like this in this setup all of a sudden allows a small company like Undeveloped to be the initiator. You know, the, 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 the larger corps uh, aren't really the innovators, they're just creaming uh, the profits that they want to, uh, that they already have. Uh, but now all of a sudden we can pool our resources and make something a reality without having... Um, so just to be sure uh, up front, uh, we're not doing an ICO or anything to fund this um, whole initiative. So what we simply did was we shared our idea with uh, industry players. We said, who believes in this? Who wants to be part of this? Um, let's make it happen uh, together. Um, and then we, as an industry, of course, benefit uh, altogether from the technology that comes out of it. Um, some other things that we're planning to do uh, with blockchain are, for example, change the way we design uh, our product. Uh, you don't, uh, currently the whole lean startup methodology is one of the main uh, methodologies that, uh, that, that everybody you know, goes for. Uh, get out of the building, do customer development and so on and come back. But by implementing uh, blockchain and using voting systems, for example, and assigning uh, specific weights to specific users, uh, we're now designing a process where our existing users can even have a say in what we build. Because eventually, uh, we as a company build what we build for them, make them part of it. And these kind of things also wouldn't scale without uh, using what's out there nowadays. But now you can actually uh, harness that 
uh, and, and make things happen. But also on bring corporate uh, value back to the users and contributors. In the current uh, world, a handful of uh, shareholders of a company amass all wealth generated by the users and so on. Uh, what we're uh, more keen into, uh, into doing is uh, share some of the, you know, or all of the, of the successes with your actual users. If you take, for example, Instagram, um, uh, imagine if all the contributors on Instagram would actually get uh, coins from Insta coins or, or what so on from, uh, from Instagram. How interesting would that be? Nowadays, if you ha you know, you're, uh, you're a good-looking dude, you have <laughs> nice long hair, uh, you have this Instagram uh, uh, account with one, two million uh, <laughs> views uh, or, or, or followers, you're creating a lot of content that drives a lot of attention and whatnot to that specific profile. But how do you now monetize it? You know, you make this picture or video with this shampoo and you get paid 10k for, uh, for showing off that shampoo and advertising. You can change these models uh, by using blockchain, cryptocurrencies, or that whole new economic um, uh, uh, yeah, engine, so to say, um, uh, to bring back corporate value that a company has uh, back to the, to the users. Very interesting uh, model. Like I said, I would keep it very short so we can have a very active Q and A. Um, so let's let's uh, let's uh, let's have a Q and A. Uh, are there any any questions? <laughs> questions. questions. Uh, for undeveloped itself, or the we get a commission. So we get a 9% commission on all transactions. Yeah, but that's the undeveloped model. And for uh, Dan, the domain automation network, uh, every transaction that's initiated, uh, there is a specific very low fee uh, that you pay in the, uh, in the what we call the web coin, uh, which is the in-house built coin uh, of the network. And uh, all the revenue generated uh, in the system uh, will be simply used to buy back uh, web coins from the public market, which creates a sort of um, a loop, uh, which is uh, also quite interesting. But uh, yeah, we don't have too much time to uh, dive into details. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what's the idea behind renting domains if you can buy one for ten dollars? That's registering domains. We're talking about giving you access to the best names out there. So all the good names, you know, dictionary names, etc., they're all gone. Uh, and like I said in the beginning of my presentation, of the 343 million registered domain names, uh, about 40% is, is unused. And these are the good ones, you know. We have now whiskey.com on our marketplace. It's been for sale for a very long time and uh, the seller wants, uh, wants a good, good price for that name. No startup is ever going to be able to use that domain name, while if we move to the rental model, a startup could uh, just raise a small amount of uh, seed capital or whatsoever, uh, rent the domain name, uh, and if it doesn't go well, just turn back the domain name to the owner, uh, and that's that. So that's how we want to create more liquidity in that market through, for example, rentals, which is one of the uh, models that we want to, uh, to go, uh, go for. Yeah. Um, out of that 174 million unused, um, I think the majority would be protection of uh, related names. So uh, I have a website myself and I have at least 10 related names uh, to that for protection. So yeah. uh, I registered the .com, but also like 10 the countries. The .net, the .nl, the whatever. Ex the yeah. EUs, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and uh, secondly, so, so, so first question, how much of of that did you take into account, which is never going to be rent out anyway? Almost none of them. Uh, but of course, they will be part of that. 
the way we identify that number is by uh, looking and crawling uh, uh, the, the domain name. We have a list of all domain names registered and then looking what's on them. So uh, most of these names don't even resolve. Uh, they have nothing on them or they're parked or they have a standard uh, parking uh, page from, uh, from a registrar and so on. But of course, uh, you will have um, a, a good portion of, of the names that you mentioned, uh, but that's definitely not more than 10% uh, or even 5%, uh, so to say. It's, uh, we, we daily see on our... Um, so you would say 95% of that number is represented by like people who register for a profit to sell or lease no, not their domain. Yeah, that's that's also another misconception. Uh, about 25 million are actually in hands of domain resellers uh, because all of us also own, own domain names that we don't use because we had an idea, we wanted to do something, we registered it and then never used it, never offered it for sale or whatsoever. Uh, or we, we bought a domain at some point, had a business, business didn't go well, but we kept the name, etc. So the, the names aren't even in hands of uh, only resellers, that's, that's a relative small, uh, small portion. Uh, it's uh, you and I literally uh, sitting on those names and not doing anything. And, uh, part of that is because the uh, market is so inefficient. The parties that where you can actually monetize or sell your domain names are also outdated. Uh, you know, uh, the main monetization model in the industry currently, which uh, we, from our perspective, really don't like, is PPC. So they, you know, those all those pages filled with ads. Um, and that's what should change. Those names should should move to uh, yeah. final. Final question. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, I've I've bought uh, domain names through marketplaces, through negotiations, yeah. um, with escrow elements in, in well, with escrow inside of that. Yeah. So what would your model change yeah. to what already uh, works fine for me? I don't yeah. feel the pain yet. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure what kind of budgets you have, but uh, what we see daily on our marketplace is that about 82% of the trans uh, of um, uh, buyers coming in through negotiations don't end up with the domain name. Uh, and the ma vast majority doesn't end up with the name because the, the domains are just too expensive. And that's where the biggest pain point lies. We all of a sudden make them way more affordable by introducing rentals, for example. If you can rent a domain name for 99 bucks uh, a month, uh, instead of having, pay, having to pay uh, 20 to 30,000 euros, uh, all of a sudden it's way more accessible for you and uh, for a uh, larger uh, audience. I, th I think you have some things to discuss at the bar uh, <laughs> later. <laughs> and we'll have a couple of minutes break in between. The, there were a few more questions. One here in front. Very short question. Uh, yeah. Is there a specific reason you started with Dot Store? Is it popular or is it... New? No, but, uh, yeah, we see a very big parallel with real estate and uh, domains. Uh, and that store was the perfect parallel because uh, the vast majority of, uh, well, not vast majority, but a lot of uh, store owners rent a, a store. Uh, you know, you don't buy a store to uh, start a bakery or, or, or whatsoever. Uh, so we started with that parallel just because it also already would resonate with our kind of messaging of, you know, uh, you rent your store, why don't you also rent your domain name, in a sense. That was uh, why we went for, um, uh, for that. I think we have a question. Yeah, I, I had a question here, and when I look at the time, uh, I, I would say this is the final question. Uh, <laughs> sorry for that, but there will be plenty of room to ask questions yeah, later. Very quick question. Uh, as you said, uh, like uh, you can rent your stores, yeah. but stores is not your uh, identity, yeah. and stores uh, is temporary, but domain name is your identity, yeah. and uh, you can't change it. For example, if you have vision that my company will be in this place after 10 years, yeah. but you start with the domain name that is rented, maybe tomorrow the renter will put another conditions yeah. or... Yeah. 
uh, even, Perfect even question. Uh, not conditions, yeah. but in general. Yeah. How do you think that temporary yeah. of uh, renting process yeah. and uh, identity and domain? Yeah. So it's I it's a that. perfect question. That's why we really set up the pilot to learn about these kind of issues and uh, to see what kind of problems uh, rentees would have. And the way we solve that is by uh, introducing just variables in the contract that you can set. For example, you can rent a domain name uh, for as long as you pay the rental. So the, the owner can't all of a sudden say, yeah, uh, next month uh, I'm taking my domain back, I'm selling it so, uh, to someone. But you can also include already upfront uh, mechanisms like a purchase option for the rental that, they ca that the rentee can... Um, uh, act on whenever they want to. So there are all these models that we can introduce uh, where a contract can be, you know, really designed the way you want it and the way you want to, uh, yeah, feel safe and secure about actually renting a name and building your million, billion dollar business actually on it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's definitely um, something we, c we thought about in, um, in, in our uh, building safeguards for. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a small token of appreciation oh, for your talk. Thank you. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, I don't I'll, I'll wear watches, I'll so. <laughs> thank you, mate. All right, and uh, then we will uh, going to be uh, quick with making a switch. So we'll take uh, one minute to uh, switch to the next uh, presentation. All right, um, so as uh, discussed, we would uh, continue with the second presentation straight away. Um, first part of this presentation uh, uh, will be in Dutch, and the second part uh, will be in English. Um, so we have uh, Dirk and Navid from uh, ICO Head Start, uh, who will share with us uh, how they are building a platform to screen uh, ICOs. <coughs> Uh, Dirk, I believe you're first, so I'll hand you this one. Yeah, thank you. Goedenavond, mijn naam is Dirk Scheringa. Ik uh, ben jarenlang werkzaam geweest in de oude economie. En de oude economie, dat betekent uh, dat wij uh, een voetbalclub hebben opgebouwd vanuit de eerste divisie naar de eredivisie en stap voor stap uh, naar het landskampioenschap met Louis van Gaal. En met uh, Marcel Brands en Tom Herbrands. We hebben een museum opgebouwd, stap voor stap. We hebben een bank opgebouwd, stap voor stap. Met op een gegeven moment de rechterhand uh, Gerrit Salm. En dat was een bijzondere ervaring om dat allemaal mee te maken vanuit de slaapkamer. Naar een toch een uh, bedrijf wat een miljard waard was in 2002. En later iets minder, maar dat heeft u allemaal kunnen volgen in de pers. Uh, 
daarna ben ik in 2009 begonnen met heel veel start-ups te begeleiden. En start-ups, dat vond ik leuk om te doen. Alleen start-ups hebben een nadeel dat uh, van de acht van de tien, die gaan wat moeilijker. En die halen het niet. Uh, en daarna heb ik een wat andere bedrijf opgezet die nog goed, goed draaien. Totdat ik in september vorig jaar gevraagd werd door de founders van Eiko Head Start om mee te willen doen en mee te denken met uh, de nieuwe economie, met blockchain en cryptocurrency. Dat hebben ze mij toen uitgelegd. De eerste keer was het moeilijk om te begrijpen, maar na een aantal keer uitlegd uh, vond ik het uh, geweldig. Want ik was ook actief met een crowdfunding platform en uh, IPO heb ik meegemaakt. En dit was weer een nieuwe vorm van de manier van hoe ga je, ga je geld ophalen. En momenteel zijn we bezig met het... Uh, het samenstellen en uitbreiden van een heel goed team. En dan heb je een CTO uiteraard nodig en een CFO. Een recruiter voor projecten. Een projectbegeleider. Uh, communicatie. Blockchain specialist. Een tokenized specialist. Nou, het kan nog wel een tijdje doorgaan. Van allemaal top mensen die je tien jaar terug nog helemaal niet nodig had. Dat bestond nog niet. En dat vind ik uh, een geweldige uitdaging. Om dat uh, motor mee te maken. Uh, het oude netwerk erbij te betrekken. Community op te bouwen en op die manier een, een fantastisch platform neer te zetten, wat net even anders is dan de andere platformen. Want wij doen een hele strikte en strenge screening. Dus alle projecten die ons benaderen, worden eerst streng geselecteerd door een screeningsteam, zodat wij uiteindelijk maar 5 tot 10 procent gaan listen op ons platform. En wat dan, dan weer uniek is, dan beslissen wij niet of de creators geld krijgen, maar dat doen de backers. En de backers beslissen op een gegeven moment met stemrechten, wie geld krijgt. En dat gaat Navid nu allemaal even uitleggen. En die gaat hij doen in het perfect Engels, zodat ook de buitenlandse gasten het goed kunnen begrijpen. Dank je. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Great. Going from no watch to such a big watch is indeed something special. So my name is Navid Habib. Uh, my background is actually in something totally different. I've studied pharmacy at the University of Utrecht and the University of Antwerpen, simply because my mom and dad were both pharmacists. Um, in 2010, I even became student of the year in Holland. Uh, I have been in business from the age of 17. <laughs> I've been in uh, the online world, in fashion, I've even had my own pizzeria, I don't know even how to bake pizzas. Uh, I've had my own software company. Uh, in total, I'm owner of seven companies besides ICO Head Start. And uh, four years ago, I started in this world of blockchain technology. And uh, I believe in 2016, yes, it was uh, early 2016 was the first ICO I invested in. In total, in 2016, I invested in approximately 10 ICOs, of which three went really great, had very big returns, amazing returns, and uh, the majority of them, seven of them, didn't go very well. And I was doing it as a hobby, so besides my other businesses. And um, somewhere at the end of 2016, besides uh, my other businesses, I was 20 hours per week busy with uh, phone calls with friends, family members, uh, WhatsApp groups, where we uh, spoke with each other and advising each other, very amateuristic, on which of the ICOs would be, would, would be something legit, uh, where we could uh, back the project and probably earn some money on, and which of them were not so good. And at that time, I understood that there is a, by, by going from nothing to 20 hours per week with some business, you understand there is probably potential. And we started to develop a platform called ICO Head Start, which would be a plat platform where people, in a very secure way, uh, could contribute in the world of ICOs. Um, what we did was totally different from other ICOs, because a lot of ICOs back then, they wrote a white paper, and some of those white papers were like three or four pages. They went on the market, built a group, mostly on Telegram or sometimes also on Facebook, and they raised a lot of money. And sometimes we were calling each other, my uh, partner, 
uh, in this business also, Alexander Martinovich and myself, and we were asking each other, are we so stupid that we don't understand this business or are people just going with the flow? And at a certain moment, we understood that the second was more often the case. And um, we so we, we, we really developed this platform in 2016 uh, from scratch, from our own money. We, uh, in 2017, we started to develop the team, half of 2017. There is where we also approached Mr. Scheringa. But what we did is we built bridges between the old and the new economy. Because what we saw were that, that there were a lot of young, enthusiastic uh, entrepreneurs who started a certain project, who were passionate, uh, but sometimes didn't understand the basics of building a business. They had a lack of experience most, more often. And um, a lot of people followed these people uh, because they had a good marketing paper, let's say it like that. And we tried to change that by having a bridge between the old economy, as Mrs. Schering has said, and the new economy where we have compliance officers, we have people who do the, the due diligence, uh, legal department, we have people who have uh, assessed like 10,000 applications for financing and funding per week. So these people really have decades of experience. And we combine this knowledge with people who are developers, who understand the technical part, uh, tokenization, tokenomy uh, of, of, of ICOs. So let's start a bit of, of the presentation. Uh, what you see is uh, there are two terms. There is the ICO, which is the initial coin offering, and there is the ITO, which is the initial token offering. More often, the tokens are based on an ERC-20, which is Ethereum. And uh, what, when the Ethereum came on the market, you saw also a very, very big rise of IC, uh, ICOs and ITOs. Uh, at this moment, the, the, the platforms which are uh, assessing or screening ICOs, they do some kind of a screening. They look at the white paper, they see if they have a clear development roadmap, or it's an open source or publi published code, if there is a clear and fair pricing. Some of these uh, things they assess, but they don't go deeper than this. Uh, what you see is in 2014, actually, ICOs started. The first uh, ICO, big ICO, was from Ethereum. They did 18.9 million. Back then, you could buy Ethereum for almost nothing, you know. And now Ether is worth over $800, and uh, it goes up and down a bit. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are watching their blockfolio a lot of times. But back then, you could buy it for nothing. If you would have bought back then a few thousand euros in Ether, you would be very rich right now. In 2015, again, 14 million, not so much. In 2016, that's where it started. That's when I was also investing for the first time in ICOs. It was 222 million, and the people who were investing in ICOs were from uh, Apple, Google more often, who had a bit of technical background or for, from Silicon Valley. And um, somewhere in 2017, start of 2017, half 2017, I uh, heard my neighbors for the first time speaking about blockchain, cryptocurrencies. And then I understood that now probably a lot more people are going to join, and that's what happened. Uh, this is a bit of an old slide. Uh, it says 3,500 million, so 3.5 billion in ICOs. But, uh, I think we ended registered in 2017 somewhere around four and a half, five billion in funding in ICOs. And if you look at the total crowdfunding volume in 2017, it was approximately 34 billion worldwide. So that means that ICOs took over a market somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of the total crowdfunding uh, volume. And 2018 is going to be much more bigger, we believe. A lot of people, they think that ICOs equal cryptocurrency, or even blockchain equals cryptocurrency, which is not the case. Uh, if you look at the ICO market, in 2014, you see that this one is Cortec. A big amount of ICOs was Cortec, and a small amount was Cloud. And if you look at 2017, this was cryptocurrencies, the smallest part actually, or one of the smallest parts. You see that uh, Cortec had a very big part in ICOs, but you see also that from media, social, gaming and gambling, 
Internet of Things, finance market, finance investment, finance banking, and a lot more industries, industries where ICOs are coming from. So the market is changing continuously. Where also in 2017, end of 2016, starting to 2017, I thought from some industries, no way you can do an ICO over there. I'm seeing right now that people are very innovative and they're coming up with amazing tokenization models where I never could imagine that that particular business could do an ICO. Okay, so where is this money coming from? Besides my neighbors who think that uh, they will invest uh, 100 euro and probably next year they will be multimillionaire. You see also that within the community also mining pools invest a lot in ICOs, exchanges, funds and traders of currencies. Companies who really are focused now, initial coin offering initial, they are specialized in it. But you see also traditional financial investors who are now switching from the old economy into the new economy. And this list is growing and growing every day. So you see that the venture capital community has been the most engaged uh, because they see volume from the crowdfunding going to ICOs. The high finance community, such as hedge funds and private equity, they are at the start. They don't really understand what is really happening, especially in the Netherlands. Uh, at, I know one of my first meetings was, was with a guy from a hedge fund, the owner, and he told me he knew what, I, what ICOs were, and uh, I believe within five minutes uh, he told me, okay, I don't know anymore what ICOs are, please explain me, and, uh, because he had a very strange idea about ICOs. So you see, and the retail demand is bubbling through, it's nowhere yet, but these, these people are also catching up at, as we speak. You see that employees, users, and community members, it's actually the same riddle as internet. In 1994, 1995, when internet came, the same thing happened. You, know, you saw that employees, users, and the community members were really adapting very fast to the market, and that sovereign powers and governments and, and big institutions, they were very heavy, you know, these mammoth tankers, which could not really switch from the one to the another. And, and that's what is happening the same way right now. These, these big institutions are having a very hard time to catch up because the technology is also changing extremely fast. So in all of this, we are trying to play a role to make it more understandable, more secure, and that's where our platform uh, came uh, with the idea of, of doing the screening of ICOs. So we did also our own ICO on our own platform, Practice What You Preach. In December, we uh, sold 2.5% of our token. We have a token, it's called MOAT, that's, or MOAT, as the English people are saying it. I, uh, I was joking around, it sounds like GOAT, but MOAT. And uh, we raised, uh, for 2.5% of our token, somewhere around $3 million in crowd sales. That's very big, one of the biggest pre-sales. And uh, we raised $8.8 .8 million through angel investors. That's a big amount of money, of course. So that's, uh, that was a pretty big success. And uh, our token has now a value somewhere around two and a half, three dollar cents, and we have 10 billion of those, so that's a lot, of, a lot of tokens. And we are doing our ICO very soon, within four weeks from now. And so if you compare us, and I, if you compare ICOs actually and us with the other types, so if you look at Kickstarter, if you raise funds through Kickstarter, the average success rate is they're 16%. Average loan rate is 11%. Peer-to-peer -peer loans are 9%. And we, do, we build a unique platform where we don't ask backers and project creators any fees. There is 0% fee. So where do we earn our money? We, are, we earn our money on good token contracts because we build a model that we can be successful only if the projects are successful. So we need to choose the right projects to be able to, success, to be successful. So our rates are 0% and we earn on token contracts. So if a project comes to us, they want to do an ICO through our platform, we make sure that we make a good token deal. And how we can earn on the token if the project becomes successful. If they fail, we lose. So that's a very uh, balanced and honest platform we made. What we do is we give access to the safest ICO proposals. Um, as said before, we have a team of experts who are doing the screening on one side, and on the other side, we, have, we use the wisdom of the crowd. So we have compliance officers, a legal department, we have professional traders, we have um, developers who are doing 
the screening, selecting and certifying of these projects. Once these projects are listed, then it goes in the hands of our community members and these community members can vote which of these uh, listed ICOs can be successfully funded by our platform. That's how our platform works. So these are all the unique selling points, what we have. And this is our economy, how we call it. It looks very difficult to understand, but it is pretty easy. On, the, on this side, we have the community members. They invest, normally they invest their ether into the projects, for example. And they get a token XYZ back for that. And mostly they can exchange this, these tokens on the exchanges, such as Bittrex, Bitfinex, uh, and others, uh, to, to, uh, with Bitcoins, for example. And if you want to cash out, you can exchange your Bitcoins on, uh, uh, on Bitonic in the Netherlands, for example. And the next day at 12 o'clock, it's on your account, your euros. That's how fast the market is right now. In our case, you uh, exchange your ethers and bitcoins on our platform for MOATs. And the MOAT is the mother of our token. Why it's called the mother of our token? Because it's indirectly linked with, of course, these, the success of these projects. If you invest 10 ether, you get the equal amount, the day rate for MOAT in return to your wallet, but you also get 10 voting points. Let's say we have, uh, of the 100 projects, we list three of those projects on our platform, then this community member can say, okay, project A gets one vote, project B gets three votes, project C, I like the most, gets six votes, or project C gets 10 votes. Let's say you need 1,000 uh, ether, which is equivalent, let's say, approximately, of, uh, to make it uh, a round number, $1 million. Then you need 1,000 votes from our community members to be successfully voted. If you are, we have, in the ICO world, you have soft caps and hard caps, Soft cap means the minimum amount you need to be successfully funded, and the hard cap is the maximum what you accept. The moment that you reach your soft cap, the minimum amount of votes, then you are successfully funded by our platform. And that, on the other side, what we do is, with these, before these projects can be listed on our platform, we select, screen, and certify these projects. With our seal of approval, the ICO has our seal of approval, and we have a scorecard analysis, which actually educates our members on which basis we listed these projects. Because at this moment, it's a wild west. And um, when people uh, get in touch or uh, get to know an ICO, it's mostly because they saw a Facebook ad and that's already banned. Or uh, they have an influencer who screamed a lot, you know, you have to invest in this ICO. And they go on the website of this uh, certain ICO and 95% of the people don't read a white paper even though the right white paper is more of a marketing paper, not a prospectus, but they don't read the white paper. The majority of them, they watch uh, uh, animation, they look at the one pager and they say in a split second, I do or I don't do. Why is that? Because the majority of uh, these people, they invest approximately $275. So you're not going to do 200 hours of research for investing $275. That's what is happening right now. And our seal of approval, approval is there to give them a more educated choice. So with one click, so we have hundreds of hours of research done. With one click, you can see, OK, according to this, this, and this, and this, this is the score for this, this is the score for this, this is the score for this. I don't have to do my research. So I say yes or no. I want to back this project because I like this project. I think it contributes to a better world, better environment, etc. And on the other side, we also have an escrow account and a token contract. The token contract, there is where our profit lies, of course. And the escrow account is a smart contract, actually, a time-released contract. It, it's actually to secure that you do exactly what you say you, you will, you're going to do with the funds. If you raise $10 million, and I will give you tomorrow $10 million, what happens right now, and you go to Hawaii, and I don't see you back anymore, these people, they cannot do anything. They can only be mad, go on forums, say it's a scam, and that's it. In this case, our platform makes sure that they do what they say they will do with the, with the funds. So according to their roadmap, their milestones, they will get the, the funds from our company. If, let's say, we transfer 10% of the funds and they don't deliver, then we shut down that uh, agreement the voting points go back to the accounts of the community members and they can vote for another project which does deserve uh, to get funded. So it's a very honest approach of doing business. 
When we transfer the funds to them, we get the token. The tokens will be traded by our professional trading company, which is uh, under Ron van der Does. He has 32 years knowledge of trading tokens, his company. So they will tr professionally trade these tokens on the exchanges. With the profit we make, we use 80% to exchange back in MOAT from the exchanges to go to our reserve. And in that way, when new people come, they invest Ether. Out of reserve, they get MOAT. And we exchange with the profits we make, 80% we use to get MOAT back to our uh, reserve. So that's the whole physio circle what is running on this side. So we sell MOAT and we buy them back from the exchanges. And on the other side, we use 20% of our profit to give newly listed ICOs a head start funding. So we motivate ICOs also to be compliant towards the rules of our platform. We say, listen, if you score very high according to our scorecard analysis, one of the things. The second thing is, if you want also to accept MOAT as funding, that's up to maximally 5%, you can accept zero, you can accept 5%. But if you accept MOAT, probably our community will love you because they possess the MOAT also. That's one of the things, uh, requirements. And in the future, we will also have agreements with third parties who will screen these ICOs also. So we are completely independent. You can see, okay, this is the seal of approval of ICO Head Start, and this is company B and C, who are also screening these ICOs. And according to these three screenings, I will say yes or no to ICO. So according to these three things, our seal of approval, acceptance of MOAT as a MOAT favorite project, and third party screenings, we say, okay, if you, do, if you score very high over there, you get uh, a head start funding from our company with the profits we make. So we will have, we did our pre-ICO, which was successful. We will do a 30 days ICO, which will be at the end of March. There we sell 12.5% of our tokens. And we expect that we will be a very big company. We will list, uh, even though we list a small amount of ICOs, we will have still hundreds of projects who will be listed on our platform in the future. And we will most probably become a very big company. I hope uh, one of the billion dollar businesses. And this is what we do with the funds we raise. We have some part which we use for operations, uh, research and development, marketing, legal, funding of upcoming projects. And we have a part for, of early investors and contingency. And this is our team at the moment. From that is much more than this, but these are operational at this moment. We have a lot of developers at the other side. We have people from a company from Minsk who we're working with uh, in Bosnia and Serbia. A lot of talent over there. Uh, we have a company which is Flash Boys from the Netherlands under uh, the hood of Mark Norlander. And these are our strategic partners. And this is something which I would like to share with you guys. Imagine what would happen if Visa did an ICO for money movement tokens or Facebook did an ICO for units of human attention. Do not be afraid. Experiment, fail, learn, experiment again. This is unproven ground. It's like going back in 1994, 1995, and I'm telling you about internet. So that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any questions in the room? Yeah, I think I was, uh, yes. Let's start here. Hi, a very interesting talk. So um, I didn't quite get uh, what your uh, revenue uh, model is, and you also said like if the project fills, then uh, then we then uh, that basically also doesn't do you well. Could you elaborate yes. on that? Of course. Yeah, let me go back. So as I said, we we earn on token contracts, meaning we have a reserve, and our reserve is 50% of the MOAT. When somebody comes on our platform and exchanges their ethers for MOATs, yes, they get MOATs, we get ethers. We give these ethers to these projects, yes, and we get their tokens back. With their tokens, we need to make profits. If we are not able to make profits, we will lose value on the market of our MOATs because we don't have make profits. We cannot buy back MOATs to go to our reserve. We cannot bring value on the market, and that's how it affects us. So we exchange. We get the ethers, we exchange the ethers for the tokens, and tokens have no value. Ethers have value. True? The ethers have value. The tokens don't have value anymore. There's where we lose money. We lose value on the market. That's how it affects us. 
So we are the only platform who does it like this. The majority of ICO, actually all ICO platforms, they say, I list whatever I want on the platform, and if they become a success, I take my percentage, and then I'm done. No responsibility whatsoever of what you have presented to, the, to your community. We have huge responsibility because we can only earn money if the tokens become valuable in the future. That's our platform. Follow-up uh, question, then you also have a, uh, have an escrow system where you release funds based on uh, milestones uh, that these uh, initiatives hit, right? Yeah. So what happens if a company decides to pivot and go for some other uh, you know, model or you know, change the product? There's like no centralized board that they can pitch their idea to. Yeah, so we do, we do. Yeah, the, the, the escrow is, a, is a, a, a complex thing because a one part is, of it is time released. It's fixed things. There are stuff which you cannot fix with the time release contract. So we can make a point, uh, agreements amongst each other that this is what you're going to do. And if things happen in the future where you can come, not come up with your promise, but you have to make changes in your product, service, or whatever for the, for the uh, benefits of everyone, of course, we are token we have your token, so it's also in our benefits that you change your, your way. In that way, it doesn't affect by you not getting your money because we will always, from our side, uh, uh, think with you to be, do the best what is possible on the market. Because if we don't allow you to do what is best for your market, the tokens will become uh, zero value and then everybody lost in this case. So the, 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 the economy is very well balanced, you know. It's, it's, it's the opposite of what we see on, on the markets uh, right now, where mostly one person is the victim and the other is the winner. In this case, or we win all, or we lose all. <laughs> that's that's, uh, so that's so what... The ICO at start uh, needs to agree to any proposed changes. Yes, yes, definitely, yeah. Right. Next question uh, was here in front. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I had a similar question about the escrow part, because it's quite complex in the it end. Is. How do you determine if someone is still online or not? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you've answered that greatly. I like the model uh, quite a lot, uh, especially from uh, ICO Head Start's perspective as well. How, what's the feedback from the companies that actually want to do an ICO? Because you do yeah. add quite some limitations for definitely. them by uh, setting up specific structures and yeah. rules. Definitely, um, definitely. Isn't that your so, bottleneck a little bit? Yes, yes, yes. That's a good question. A lot of companies say F you. <laughs> that, that's what it is because what we are doing is uh, we are going into a market where there are a lot of cowboys and we are, see, so we are saying, guys, we need self-regulation. I don't know if this is going well. <laughs> so we are saying, guys, we need self-regulation because if we don't do anything, what will happen is somebody else will come and they say uh, this is black and this is white and then you have bigger trouble. So we have a lot of supporters and we have a lot of people that are the opposite of that and that's what happens when you go into a new field, you know, and you want to do stuff which they're not used to. So how many do you have? A lot, a lot, a lot. We have, we have a lot of projects. M much more than we can handle, to be honest with you, at this moment. So there is a lot of requests. It's not that people say, uh, you know, why projects are going to be listed, on, uh, why projects do want to be listed on a platform. First of all, if you are a legit company, there are hundreds and thousands of ICOs. You would like somebody to tell the world that you're legit and that you're not a scam. So third party legitimacy is very important, extremely important also in the ICO market. Besides that, you can get a head start from us, you can get access to the right community. You know, when I, for, for myself, start, wanted to do an ICO in the start, I would beg somebody to tell me all of this, you know, to, to take me by the hand, to guide me in the right direction, because nobody knows how to do an ICO uh, uh, when, when they start with the idea of doing ICO. So from having a good white paper, having a good animation, uh, the, 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 the best ICO practice, from a legal point of view, you know, if you start doing an ICO, you go to the first lawyer, I, I promise you, you'll go empty pockets out <laughs> because they are very expensive. And there we can contribute a lot, you know, to make the costs much more lower for you to be able to do an ICO. When we started to do uh, with the idea of ICO, if you invested a million, which is a lot of money, you could raise 25, 30 million in beginning of 2017, late 2016. Later on, in half of 2017, it went from 1 to 25 to 1 to 10. Now it's somewhere around 1 to 5, 1 to 7 maybe, you know? 
So that's a big risk, you know. So what we are doing, wh why you need to spend so much money uh, mostly, is because you uh, don't, uh, you, 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 you will go and spend money on people who don't really can help you, you know. You go to a marketing company, you go to this, they don't have an idea how to build a community within the ICO uh, space. So what we do is we connect you with the right people, so from the start you will not give uh, a lot of money to emailing list, which will not bring you anything, or a lot of other stuff where we have experienced and a lot of other ICOs have experienced. Where there is money, there are a lot of scammers also. So what we do is we guide you along the road to do a good ICO for the lowest amount of costs. Right. I know there's a couple of more questions uh, here in the room, but I have to look at the time uh, as well. Um, so we're going to take a, a five minute break. So if you have any more questions to Navid or to Dirk, uh, yeah, you, you can take your time, uh, but we'll be back here in five minutes for the next presentation. If you want to get a drink or so, uh, the bar is still open. So, see you back here in five. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, thank you. Navid, Dirk, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kan jij gaat het werken? Ja hoor. Ja. Oké, ga dan. Kunt even testen.